Hello my friends and comrades and welcome back to yet another video on the MCP channel. Now the MCP subsection has been conducting an investigation into the Sino-Soviet split of late and let me ask the listener a question. What do you think is the main difference between Chinese and Soviet communism in the economic sphere? We know that in the political sphere Mao continued the class struggle under the proletarian dictatorship. Many are tempted to think that this is the only difference between the two, and that China economically followed the same entirely centralised model as the Soviet Union until Mao died, when all of a sudden she was totally opened up by Deng Xiaoping, and from the Western perspective was saved and prospered because of the free market. This however is not true. Mao did not adhere to the Soviet economic model until his death, and actually there is really quite a smooth line from the economic policy under Mao to that under Deng. Deng's primary fault is not even economic at all, and I say that as a Maoist. Now this may all sound confusing, so let's take a deeper look. After the Sino-Soviet split, and once the Great Leap Forwards had established China's industrial base, Mao Zedong, with his magnificent perceptiveness, observed the struggling forces of production and saw a need to liberate them, and began to depart from the Soviet model of entirely centralised planned economy. Of course, at first in China, that totally centralised economy was highly necessary to industrialise a country and to drag China into modernity at a rapid rate. Even the British had to use protectionism to create their textile industry and allow it to overtake the monopoly of the Netherlands had, and then after she had industrialised, she started duping people with this narrative of comparative advantage free market liberalism. And that's what America does too. First they use socialistic policies to develop themselves, and then they force free markets on others so that they can't develop in a sovereign and independent way. It's a scam created by the British Empire and continued today by the US Empire to make sure that they will never be a political or economic rival again. Socialism to maintain your empire, but capitalism for everyone else so that they become dependent on your sovereignty. But yes, centralisation for everyone to some degree or another is required to enter modernity. Modernisation, principally at the level of agriculture, is what causes the revolutionisation of industry. This centralised revolutionisation of a primary sphere of production has occurred in every single country that has established an independent economic base. It is always accompanied by tragedy unfortunately, but generally, the more centralised you are, the better you can deal with that tragedy. England being the first country to enter modernity both at home, but more importantly in the colonies abroad, which was also the same for the Dutch and the Portuguese later, it caused, this, this entry into modernity caused a huge disruption in the traditional way of growing food and creating not just huge famine but also um, social, cultural, moral, political and religious disaster. It's no coincidence that as we entered modernity, even within Europe itself, that nihilism, moral relativism and political chaos emerged at the same time. Even at home in Europe during these tumultuous periods of early modernity, the continent itself saw horrific famine at a scale that was far more drawn out, far more savage, far more brutal and far more dehumanising and which had a much higher death toll than what was experienced in the countries which were highly collectivised such as the Soviet Union and China who dragged themselves into modernity at a much greater speed and with extreme centralisation and with less tragedy. Modernity has the primary property of famine as a disaster that accompanies necessarily the revolutionisation of the agricultural base, but the extremely centralised and collective economies of the USSR and China, whilst, whilst they were weathering these storms, they were able to massively minimise this tragedy compared to those who had gone before them, bearing in mind that all of this was being done completely from scratch with no foreign capital investments to help. Centralisation was simply an absolute necessity in the early stages in order to revolutionise the base of production so they could actually form an independent economic base rather than be slaves to England and the Anglo-Saxon finance capital centres of the City of London and of Wall Street, which all the rest of the world had to go through the channel of, i.e. like the World Bank and the IMF 
and would have to be tied to if they wanted to develop their country. Nowadays, China offers countries an alternative route to development than the IMF, without every country having to go through this tragedy of totally from scratch having to completely build up their own economic base. With the Belt and Road Initiative, countries can take advantage of the differing levels of development through trade and investment without exploitation or ties in win-win cooperation. So now countries don't need to do what the Soviet Union and China had to, and they can now modernise without having to risk the damage to that highly sensitive agricultural base. For thousands of years, people have had a specific, non-modern agricultural way of life that worked well for growing food at a maintenance level. So standardising this and forcing it to produce the necessary surpluses to allow for modernisation and industry to exist, well, that was a larger portion of the population than ever that was not engaging in the task of raising food. And this inevitably caused an extremely violent disruption and discontinuity from the traditional way of life. So a lot of centralization is needed to minimize the scope of a catastrophe. As much violence as possible is to be avoided unless you're some sort of psychopath or something. But there are these fundamental contradictions and antagonisms that are inherent to the process of modernization. Violence is going to be intrinsic to the process, but whilst we go through this inevitable historical change, the scale of the disaster can be reduced as much as is possible through collectivization. In China then, after the Great Leap Forwards and the development of an independent economic base, there began an increasing decentralization and freeing up of markets, which continued actually through the whole Cultural Revolution, which more than anything was a political campaign. With less being planned centrally, but with provinces, villages, and eventually communes and work units privately planning their own section and how they would fulfill their part of the five year plans. Many people would consider this as a dengist policy, but it was very much in action under Mao after the reforms to the people's communes in the 1970s. One thing that did happen under Mao but didn't, was not continued under Deng was the Cultural Revolution, whose domain was political, cultural and aesthetical. The Cultural Revolution did not intend to curb the decentralising tendencies occurring in order to re-establish some sort of extremely centralised Soviet system. If anything, it's only f further deepened the decentralization, being itself a grassroots movement, grasped at the bottom and imposed not from the top down, but from the ground up. And actually Deng, although known to be a decentralizing figure in terms of the economy, politically here was actually halting this decentralizing movement and this decentralizing tendency, and was reasserting the central authority of the party when he cancelled the Cultural Revolution. So when you hear capitalist roaders being spoken of in the Cultural Revolution, you have to understand that this is not referring to those advocating for more decentralization and local economic planning. The Cultural Revolution was launched because of the concern that the economic changes that were happening already under Mao after the Great Leap Forwards would give rise to a bourgeois consciousness and that this could destroy the party. After all, it is called a Cultural Revolution for a reason. Culture is viewed as this decisive site of determining exactly what was at stake. Its role was to preserve proletarian consciousness, as this change in the economic base does indeed make it easier for capitalist roaders to emerge and for bourgeois consciousness to, to prevail than in the collective periods of harsh poverty and total centralization. But these economic changes were being implemented already under Mao and the cultural revolution was a way to combat the bad tendencies arising from them. That's why these tendencies became very dominant under Deng, because he carried on the same economic policy, but did not have the political policy to accompany it. So what, when, as you have a more decentralized economic model, you need more grassroots policing um, to accompany it, to regulate it. So that is the political change under Deng, the cancelling of the Cultural Revolution. This did have some very bad moral effects and is likely responsible for the rise again in pornography, in drug use, in prostitution, etc, etc. Although there was a tendency towards decentralization under Mao, it came to a, a rest and kind of found its level point with the reformed people's commune system in the 70s, which retained many social benefits and social securities, while still allowing for a greater distribution of the planning process.
Under Deng, though, the change in terms of organisation saw the dissolution of the commune system altogether, and its replacement with the household responsibility system of individualised agriculture. As the commune was phased out, investment in agriculture did, from the central level, drop off dramatically. The austerity of the commune period was removed as production became more individualised, freeing up surplus that would otherwise have been reinvested into collective development, but, but this did give individual peasant families larger disposable incomes, but slowed the rate of new technologies and, and that kind of thing. Decollectivization, however, had some social disadvantages in that it disempowered the peasants because of their loss of a common economic interest and it fragmented their political power. With the end of the communes, peasants lost a lot of social securities that they had access to before, such as guaranteed healthcare and work and such things, education. The disparity between the urban and rural became bigger. These issues, however, particularly in the Xi era, are indeed being dealt with slowly but surely for example, companies have to insure workers and pay for their mer medical treatments now. So the dissolution of the communes was a change in organisation and did see people lose some community and securities, although this is now being remedied. But the only real economic change, not talking about e organisation, but actual economic change was the seeking of foreign investment under Deng, the so-called opening up. This was the strategy to keep China's proportion of spending on war and militarism down by maintaining friendly relations with the West since the 70s, whereas the Soviet Union had to devote large sections of her budget to military spending, weapons, rockets, etc, etc, during the Cold War. So China, prioritising stability and national development in internal and international politics, has seen the highest annual growth rates of any country year after year, guided at the macro level by the state. China through this strategy somehow managed to rise all the way up to the second position within the established rules and institutions of a global capitalist economy without too much antagonism by leveraging its massive and educated labour force to attract foreign investment. The globalists for decades did not try to prevent this development, after all China did not interfere really with the US dominated unipolar order after the fall of the Soviet Union. But she is indeed starting to in, uh, assert herself more now. Also, the massive investments in China have returned massive profits to the West, in some ways resuscitating it from the crash of the 1970s. But now a tipping point has been passed though, and China has become more politically assertive as her economy has grown. The growth of the country has been so continuous and prolonged and she has, that she has entered fields such as pioneering technology, which the West had long assumed monopoly over, which could mean that she becomes the main driver of the world's economy, and many would argue she already has since 2008. Moreover, she offers win-win development options, as mentioned earlier, without ties, meaning that countries no longer either have to go through the IMF or painfully create a new economic base from scratch. They can make use of China's development already. China's rise alone guarantees antagonism with US imperialism, not her policies in this or that country, or a human rights record. No matter the character of her leadership, if the Kuomintang were in charge or if she had different in international policies, um, foreign policy, the country can now never be reduced to a puppet or a minor partner of the West. This is why things have changed now. Mike Pompeo, when acting as the CIA chief, declared China to be a more of a threat to the US national security and interests than Russia or Iran, two other thorns in the side of imperialism, which have actually confronted the US imperial aims more directly on the battlefield. Now the feats of this strategy are amazing. The question is though, did this policy affect the status of China as a socialist country? Well. What is important to note is that China's promotion of a freer market also corresponds to having sovereign national industries, like the nationalised oil industry, which provides sovereign control over the economy first, and then there can be space for market exchange afterwards. China never did just open up. She maintained control over strategic enterprises, maintained the state-owned enterprises under public ownership of land, 
Plenty of countries adopting the IMS total free market have not come to success like China, whose success is not principally just because she has a market, and is not just ordered to opening everything up, but is actually because she has combined markets with sovereign control and social ownership of the means of production. China also, when she opened up, did not allow foreigners to own her means of production, as the IMF neoliberal model permits and would recommend, so Walmart or whatever company would not actually own a factory in China, but the factories were owned by Chinese companies who would make the stuff for the foreigners, which were the contractors of these companies. Therefore, all the money stays inside of China, so sovereignty is the number one thing. Sovereignty, more or less, is socialism. The next thing to bear in mind is the fact that there exists no dichotomy between markets and socialism. Socialism socialised those means of production that cannot be sold on markets, things that would be impossible to be on the market without becoming monopolies. Some means of production are needed regardless of a market, the other ones needed to facilitate the market exchange itself. That's why the most common forms of monopolies are infrastructure, electricity, things that facilitate that market exchange, as opposed to the things that are actually being exchanged on a market. The tendency for monopolies to form happens when the means of facilitating the market become exchanged on the market itself. China recognises that there are certain means of production necessary for our common social reality, so she nationalises infrastructure in the oil industry, etc, etc, in order to facilitate a more equal market. Chinese markets aren't free at all really, and that's actually why she has a freer market than the US. She knows what to nationalise and what to take off the market, in order that the market can be fair. Some things have to be taken out of the market. So yes, in, a, in China, you do not have everything totally centralised, and you do have smaller companies privately organising themselves into executing their part of the plan, which the plan being executed absolutely does happen. The Communist Party has a seat on every board in order to ensure they all work in tandem. All of this is happening alongside state-owned heavy industry. China doesn't necessarily feel like what people, maybe in the West, would think of as being socialist. It's a very entrepreneurial society, there's a strong hard work, work ethic and competition, in spite of the fact that you'd have something like the Chinese government owning all the land at the same time. People who say that they believe in capitalism are usually associating it with certain qualities and values that intuitively make sense to people, and that they are familiar to most people, and most people be terrified to see gone. But when we speak as cap of capitalism, we speak of it not as an ideology or a set of values of like competition or um, hard work ethic or anything like that, but we speak of it as a mode of production. So in China, it may not feel socialist or whatever, and you might even see the process of MCM Prime. But what must be remembered is that th this is not the fundamental law of Chinese society, but the rise of some capital in China has just been used for socialist goals. It is not independent, and it is not what is calling the shots or directing the government. It is allowed to exist as long as it serves a purpose, and now actually is being killed off a bit, to greater and greater degrees in the Xi era. It was also only allowed to live on the CPC's terms, which is something only possible to establish under the dictatorship of the proletariat, with a societal ownership of the means of production. There's no one lobbying the Chinese government from weapons manufacturing um, corporations or anything like that. You see, you can't compare it to something like 19th century Britain, or something where the law of value and MCM Prime is the fundamental driving law, unrestricted and unpunished with only private ownership of the means of production. That's not China. Unrestrained power of capital is not China, clearly. But yes, you can have smaller companies and such things, more decentralisation within socialism, and that's not something that Deng made up, but it actually began under Mao. Like I say, this was seen especially pioneered in 1970s China, early 1970s China, with the independent and self-reliant people's communes that planned all their own economies locally 
and were all small scale, but fulfilled the ends of a national plan still. Although the policies of the dissolution of the communes, the end of the Cultural Revolution, and the seeking of foreign investment in the way it was done, in particular, are all the personal innovations of Deng Xiaoping, and it can be said to have produced some social ills, as well as aiding China's rise. These are problems for the Chinese government itself and the Chinese people to deal with. And indeed, many of those undesirable if social effects are being cleaned up now by Xi Jinping. What is important though, is that none of these constitutes a change in the mode of production, even if they're not necessarily desirable. Economically speaking, decentralization and the presence of market exchange whilst taking some things off the market, which is more or less a description of China's current um, mode of production, is purely Maoist policy. The reception of foreign investment, however, is not actually a policy of Mao's, but the reason that social evils came from it is not really because of reception of investment itself being unworkable or incompatible with socialism. Indeed, total isolationism would actually likely prevent the PRC from having any influence on world affairs at all. But likely some influence on the world and reception of foreign investment could have been achieved whilst not letting in the cult cultural and moral corruption as it occurred in history. So, it's like we're saying that Deng's problem is not in the idea of fully unleashing the productive forces itself or receiving foreign investment itself, but his problem is in politically in abandoning the continuation of the class struggle under the proletarian dictatorship and the cultural revolution. Hence, Deng's chief flaws were a lack of Maoist politics, culture and aesthetic, not a lack of Maoist economics, which he more or less directly continues because, let's face it, his policies were certainly not some sort of return to the 1950s Soviet ones that Mao had originally um, resisted. People like to envision Mao as just this orthodox Marxist-Leninist in China, and Deng as a big break from Mao, but in fact Mao was the heterodox one. Perhaps from what I have said today, you can sense how much of a break the insight of Mao is from the Soviet Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy, which under Stalin's collectivism managed to bring the country into modernity, but after Stalin was gone, and they'd already got there, they didn't really know what to do next because the Soviet Union collectivized and developed amazingly and established an ind independent economic base and heavy industry, but after that it was all said and done, we were really always the second world. They had quite a poor development of consumer goods, computers and light industry and that kind of thing. Um, and although almost everyone was housed and such things, after all they were being housed in those ugly concrete Khrushchevkas. So the standard of living was lower, and although the moral status of society and everything was better, f f by far, I mean, there was no counterculture there, there was um, no hippies, the socialist countries would have been a much better place to raise a family and to raise children in, for example, and, and that kind of thing. But you did see people defect from the Eastern Bloc to have something more superficial consumer like to have better radios and coffee or, th or that kind of thing. Um, so you do definitely need someone with the genius of Mao and that Deng continued even though he adapted in his own way which we can say is not the best but someone like Mao who can tell you what to do after you've already developed that primary sphere of industry. And although Mao was very heterodox to the Marxist Leninists of his day as Lenin was to the orthodox Marxists of his day it is because of Mao and his heterodoxy and pioneering ideas that the People's Republic of China still exists to this day, whereas the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc does not. Part of that is due to the maintenance of the central control of heavy industry and the decentralized development of light industry, but of course that is only half of Mao. Even if Deng wished to turn his back on the other half, the other reason that China has survived whether they want to acknowledge it or not, is due to the creation of a political superstructure which has sublated the contradictions in the primary stage of socialism, those contradictions arising from the Soviet planned economy model in a way that the USSR could not, which were resolved in the Cultural Revolution, which comes from Mao's teachings on the persistence of class struggle under socialism under the proletarian dictatorship. Hence we call Mao Zedong fought a qualitatively new stage 
of Marxism-Leninism. So although Deng did not destroy socialism in China or something ludicrous like that, we are not Dengists. We believe in Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, of which Deng likes to emphasize the economic side of and its break from the Soviet orthodoxy, which we are more than behind, but we, but he does not like to emphasize so much the political side of it and its own break from the Soviet orthodoxy in the political sphere, of course, because he suffered under that. Even if we would implement what we interpret as Mao Zedong thought slightly differently to what has become um, socialism with Chinese characteristics today, it is still certainly a socialist mode of production, and on top of that, we have even more in common with it because it takes a great deal from Mao, even if not everything. And even what it does not take, we can still see that it has built on and benefits from what Mao had done and the experience that he had put the country through in the Cultural Revolution. China is a socialist country, since production is ordered to social ends and the process of MCM prime, though existing, is sublated by the leading role of the CPC. It is also the world's bastion of anti-imperialism. Nevertheless, the cancelling of the Cultural Revolution, the dissolution of the People's Communes and the reform and opening up marked a change from how Mao Zedong thought was being implemented prior. The reception of investment, as it was done anyway, was something that led to much cultural degradation and spiritual pollution as Western culture got a foothold and replaced the former proletarian culture and Maoist aesthetic, likely because there was no cultural revolution anymore to fight back, or because there was no regulation that made, made it so that they only received finances, not cultural imports. Perhaps there could have been a way to receive investment without these ill social effects, I'm sure they could have been, but it has happened now. We can't change history. But this is ultimately a problem, like I say, for the Chinese people to deal with, however they see fit. But we can learn from this experience, and we can do things differently without having to force our understanding of Mao Zedong thought on the Chinese people from outside. And China has no problem with other socialist countries doing it differently. They don't want to export the Chinese system and how China develops onto everyone in the world. We don't want to copy China, but we want to learn from China. Over time though, no matter the effects we may wish to discuss that happened in the culture, the socialist political system in China has always been preserved, so any change that is to come there should come through it. Regardless of how we think China should or shouldn't have arrived here, the fact is that today she is a socialist country with adequately developed forces of production, which is why in the Xi Jinping era we are opening into a new era of authentic communist morality and the spiritual questions arise. Now that China has indeed developed the forces of production, the questions of what is the aesthetic, the culture, the values that will define further development. This spiritual orientation is what is characteristic of the Xi era. This is why, as Maoists, even though we don't want to create the contemporary PRC in our own country, or, or the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics in our own countries, China receives our unwavering support with them being a socialist country, and in particular one which, although has been shaped by Deng's effects for good or for bad, finds her origin and reason for being alive today in Mao's rejection of Soviet orthodoxy, something which we of course share. So thank you ever so much for your kind attention comrades, and I hope this sheds some light on the situation. And yes, the MCP does think that China today is socialist, but hopefully we should, you should be able to see that we are indeed Maoist, not Dengist. So until the next time we see you comrades, farewell.